Hi, my name is Maggie Werner Washburn. I'm a professor uh, at the University of New Mexico, and I've been there for 28 years. Uh, my career started in uh, working with yeast genetics and molecular biology, and I've also worked for many years in yeast genomics. And for the past 12 years, I've been working, running a program uh, aimed at, produce, at helping students from New Mexico uh, get into uh, some of the best graduate schools in the country. I'm going to start by talking about simple problems and hard problems. Simple problems uh, are like 2 plus 2 is 4. You have an automatic answer. Or how many people does it really take to change a light bulb? Just one person. There are two approaches to these, understanding these kinds of simple problems. One is Daniel Kahneman who talks in terms of cognitive psychology, and the other person is Scott Page, who discusses this in terms of complexity and mathematics. And he says, Scott Page says, that for a simple problem, one person obviously can answer the problem or, or take to fix it. But for a complex problem or a hard problem, you need a diverse team. Because with the problem is composed of multiple overlapping networks. And there may be, within the problem, multiple minima, many different potential solutions. So in order to come to the best solution for a problem that engages, say, a lot of different people, you need a very diverse group, people with different toolkits to answer the, the problem. This is an example. This is a picture from my lab. Uh, and it's uh, the, one of the first times that people were able to visualize the relationship between gene expression and protein-protein interactions. And to be able to get this analysis done, it took a very large team of people working in computer scientists and uh, science and mathematics, uh, chemistry, chemometrics, error structure analysis, uh, all sorts of people to be able to come up with this one figure. Now, most of the important problems that we're dealing with currently are hard, uh, that, that, that require uh, a great deal of thought to come to a solution. So one of them is politics and the polarization in our country. One of them is climate change. Not only understanding climate change and being able to model it, but also being able to communicate about climate change to people who may or may not uh, think that it's, it's happening or that it's caused by humans. A third thing has to do with income and wealth disparity in our country as a function of race. That is a, a stagnant challenge that we've had and the, it's very important to begin to think how we could move the needle on this so that we don't end up with a subclass based on race within the United States. And finally, uh, this problem of food uh, feeding the hungry, making sure that the food that we have to eat is good for us, uh, making sure that we are dealing with either people that, uh, situations where people don't have enough food or people are eating too much. Diversity itself is a hard problem, which is, is interesting to consider. It, there, there are many cultures. There are, within a culture, there are many differences. And so how do we figure out when, if we look at academia or faculty, business, law, medicine, any of, the, any of the kinds of occupations that require a higher education degree, and the people in those positions represent a single group within the United States, you know, how do we think about addressing that? And it's a very fascinating and interesting challenge. I thought, what are some examples of, of processes in which diversity has actually been successful. And uh, there's a movie, 42, which depicts the relationship between Branch Rickey, who was president of the Dodger organization when it was in Brooklyn in the 40s, and, and Jackie Robinson. So Branch Rickey decides that he wants a black man on his baseball team. Now, prior to that, everyone in baseball was white. So that when you thought about looking for someone who had the best skills at any position in baseball, the answer to your search was always a white man. 
Branch Rickey decided he wanted to change that. So he looked around and he found Jackie Robinson, who not only had the skills as a baseball player, but he had been on four uh, athletic teams at UCLA, four sports, and he had been in the military. So he had experience working in a diverse group. He brought Jackie Robinson in, and the two of them developed a very close relationship where he mentored Jackie Robinson and how to deal with the kinds of challenges that he was going to run into. All the people around Branch Rickey were against bringing Jackie Robinson in at first. And what happened is that gradually, as they became more understanding of what Jackie was going through and how good a baseball player he was and how important he was for the team. Jackie became part of their us and they began to protect him outside of the Dodger organization. So what happened in that process was that they began to be able to see skills of baseball players independent of race or ethnicity. Remarkably what happened in this process is that baseball itself changed. It became much more diverse. And in fact, now, almost all sports are diverse. And two years ago, uh, the owner of the LA Clippers told his girlfriend that, uh, you know, we don't hang out with black people. And what happened? He basically was kicked out of the league because the us in sports is now much bigger. The us in sports is about skills, and it's not about race or ethnicity. So it was interesting. This is a really good example of where, in the beginning, people thought that they could easily t tell who was skilled and who was not. But they were excluding whole groups of people based on things that felt that made them different. I have a personal story that relates to this in that when I was starting school, I went from a little town in Iowa to Stanford. And I went to Stanford because they called it the farm and I was from Iowa and I knew farms and my mother was from Mexico and her, once somebody who worked for their family in Mexico had once worked for Leland Stanford. I really didn't know much more than that about the school. When I got there, I felt quite isolated, uh, really I was sort of out of it, I guess. And my father died, and I got a C in a chemistry exam. And I went to see my chemistry professor, and he said, you know, I don't know how important academics is. Maybe it's not important at all. Maybe what you ought to do is quit school, get married, and go cook for your husband. I found myself in the undergraduate library a few hours after that crying, and I pulled a book down from the shelf, and it was a book of poetry. And so I thought, well, maybe this is a sign I should be an English major. And I graduated with a BA in English from Stanford. Uh, it took me five years of traveling and two more years in my master's degree to complete an undergraduate major before I was actually back in science. So my story is one not unlike many people's, many, especially many minorities. Our paths are not straight. We sometimes stop to raise families. You know, we do different things. And so what happens, I think, sometimes is that people can't really see our skills. I think about what if I hadn't gone back into science? You know, I've had 500 students at least that I've mentored in my program, in my lab, and around the country. And I just can't even imagine not having been there for them. But Think about it. It wasn't that long ago when people couldn't even begin to see that this person had skills and had a dream and had things that they wanted to do. What I'm getting to is that we sometimes think as scientists or as leaders or as heads of corporations that we uh, can easily determine someone's skills uh, and what they bring to the table. But we often don't appreciate the value of different paths and perspectives and what kinds of attributes that gives to particular skills. So it's very important to continue to do this. We need to make diversity work, but it requires 
not just flinging open the doors and allowing people to come on in. It requires people learning skills on both sides of the door. You need Branch Rickey and you need Jackie Robinson. You need people to be able to come together with a great deal of respect for each other and, and find ways that they can make magic because of their differences, not in spite of their differences. We can have deeper discussions. And what we must come to all realize is that while it takes work for us to understand how to, what biases we might have and how we might be seeing things that could be seen in a slightly different way, what we ultimately have to come to realize is that a bigger us, and it will take a bigger us, to change the world. Thank you very much.